Well, my name is Mark Koch. I'm an offshore manager for Oceaneering International, also a collector of rare history. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is the uh, number one and the number 13 lifeboats from the uh, Italian line vessel Andrea Doria. Well, probably about eight years ago, uh, a film producer named David Bright, uh, who owned these vessels, was conducting a uh, some filming a film expedition on the Andrea Doria. It was his 121st dive. He uh, lost control of his buoyancy on that dive, came to the surface and was killed. Uh, subsequently his wife, uh, Elaine, decided to sell all of his artifacts, his collection of artifacts, uh, and they were sold through an auction house in New York, New York City. He also owned the number one and the number 13 lifeboats and they were up in a farmer's field in poor condition. The number 13 lifeboat was actually being used as a barn roof. He had flipped it upside down and was parking tractors underneath it. So they weren't in very good shape. Uh, behind me is the number one lifeboat and the number 13 lifeboat, which is in Lafitte, Louisiana. Those are the only two known lifeboats to survive from the Andrea Doria. Uh, two years ago, we started the restoration on the uh, number one lifeboat and uh, it was recently completed in July, on July, beginning of July of this year. One of the unique characteristics of this lifeboat is uh, the propulsion system, and the propulsion system is uh, called a Fleming gear. Fleming gear is propelled by the passengers. There's, there's levers inside, there's 10 levers inside the boat, and the uh, passengers move those levers back and forth, and that back and forth motion is transferred to two bars that can sit underneath the deck of the boat, and they go back to a large gearbox, and that gearbox transfers that back and forth motion into a circular motion, which turns the propeller. So one cycle on the uh, uh, levers back and forth turns the prop six times. So this was to eliminate the uh, the, the uh, management of the passengers after the evacuation of the vessel where you had to row away from the ship. So it's called a Fleming gear and it was a transition between oars and prior to the engines being installed in uh, lifeboats and, and that's one of the unique characteristics of the, uh, the number one as well as the number 13 lifeboats. Some of the indentations and damage on the vessel uh, were looked at carefully and considered during the restoration. Initially we were going to remove some of those dings and dents but we decided to leave them in there because they all told part of the story of the vessel that day. Some of the indentations that you're referring to are, um, are bullet indentations and we're not sure if they came from hunters in the woods or from the Coast Guard on the day of the sinking. Uh, the Coast Guard sank several of the le remaining lifeboats that were upside down but were still afloat. When they couldn't recover them they, they sank those vessels with gunfire and uh, we subsequently took it to New York City, uh, put the boat in the water and had some of the survivors propel the boat around New York Harbor. Uh, we made three trips, three successful trips, and uh, it brought back a lot of emotions for the survivors and we had the opportunity of uh, gathering the history and bringing all those people together again for, for, for that event. We're going to continue to take the number one lifeboat around to different museums and different uh, maritime organizations and continue to tell the stories of the survivors uh, and, and let, let the world know what happened on uh, July 25th, 1956, and uh, to, to revisit the uh, lessons learned, uh, what went wrong, and what went right on that day. Uh, certainly maritime history was changed and a lot of new conventions were developed because of the event that occurred on uh, July 25th, 1956. And um, we are continuing to allow this boat to be shown to the public and, and uh, let it be functioned and operated and